Well, hello and uh, welcome to another in the series of Cafe Insights. I'm Andrew Vine, CEO of the Insight Bureau. And today I'm in conversation with Lydia Jiang from Beijing. How are you? Very well, enjoying the fresh air. I'm in Singapore where Beijing being attacked by sandstorm. Oh, I heard. Well, um, I'm delighted to have you in town. It's a great treat. Um, I have to confess, I find it slightly difficult to know exactly how to introduce you. You are a very well-known international writer in the media, a commentator on China, and a best-selling author. Tell us a little bit more about what you do. What I do? Yes, you said I'm, I'm um, based in Beijing. I'm a, a writer, social commentator, uh, a columnist, and a public speaker. I do a few lectures. But people will be very surprised, I think, to learn that when you started out as a teenage girl turning into adulthood, you were a rocket factory girl You're in Nanjing. Yes, I started while well, sixteen. My mother just dragged me out of school, so I worked at the rocket factory for ten years. So, uh, you know, I was a former rocket factory girl turned uh, <laughs> writer. I don't. I bet you don't meet one of those every day. I don't, indeed, exactly. And it's quite a journey, be from there to to today as an international journalist, writing in some of the best publications in the world and being interviewed on BBC and CNN and the, and the likes. And indeed, you wrote a book, and this is what you're most famous for, of course, is Socialism is Great. Tell us why you wrote that book and what it really tells us. The book is called Socialism is Great. It's actually a, a popular revolutionary song. The title actually comes from the publisher. Okay. It's sort of very interesting. Uh, it's not about socialism, it's, it's all about me. I bought my life working at uh, the factory um, in the 80s. I wrote an article about my my experience. Actually, after talking this with a writer called Peter Hustler, when he learned I was uh, I worked at a rocket factory for 10 years, he was very surprised. He said, what do you know about about experience? So I did. Mm. And many people said, well, this is so interesting. And I, I, and I just realized that there are so few books set in the 80s. Yet the 80s was the most fascinating era in contemporary China. Because that was the time Deng Xiaoping just introduced economic reforms, which slowly transformed China. Mm. It's a time really people come to terms with what happened, and the sea changes took place. Um, it's a time people began to dream the impossible. I mean, I was a factory worker. I used mm. to teach myself English and mm. become a writer. Anyway, so that was a really fascinating era. In many ways, that's, that's a time China became what it is today. It's interesting because the book on the face of it is your story, but at the same time, it's very much about China's incredible development as well. I think, I guess, the personal story always brings history alive. And interestingly, I think of my own personal journey uh, also very much mirrors what happened in China. You know, the, the social transformation started by the introduction of Deng Xiaoping's reform and opening up policy. Yeah. Yeah, I remember, you know, things changing just so dramatically. One journalist described how in the 80s how China changed mm. from a black-white photo to a colored one. And, oh, and, and uh, yes, another journalist kind of famously joked that uh, after Deng Xiaoping introduced economic reform, Chinese women suddenly got breasts. Oh. <laughs> because, before, <laughs> because before that, everybody was wearing Chairman Mao's lumpy jacket. You know? right. Women started wearing more stylish clothes and all that. I know that you write a lot about women, actually, in, in society. Of course, yes. in China. China's got a record of actually engaging women in the economy, much more than many other uh, nations have done. Yet, there's still a lot to talk about in terms of the role of women in society. Yes, absolutely. And actually, just a few months ago, I was invited to give a conference about the changing role of Chinese women told mm. through the story of my family. My, my grandmother was a, a, a prostitute turned a concubine, mm. and my mother was a factory hand all her life when I was a rocket factory girl 10 uh, writer. I think the Chinese Communist Party has done a lot for women. Mm -hmm. Mao famously said women can hold up half, half the sky. The world. Yeah, half, half the sky, the sky. That's yes. Right, yes. So that statement is as, as elusive as the sky itself, but as the Chinese Communist Party has done a, a lot. You know, um, abolished the, you know, all the feudal practice and concubine, forced marriage, would before women were not allowed to divorce, for example. Marxist authorities believed in the Marxist theory that the two liberated women, women must take a part in production. Yes, so that's why the China now, a high percentage of women do work. But the economic opening up and reform also brought setbacks. For example, the income gap is widening. The female employment is going down, prostitution going up, 
women, they are finding much harder in finding employment. Because before, no matter you were a girl or a boy, you were assigned a job by the government. Right. I think government retreated a lot of responsibility to the market. Right. Now, you also comment a lot about how China is continuing to develop. I think there, you know, from the outside at least, there are many worries about China. There's a worry about China's slowdown yes. and whether that is going to cause social uh, disharmony and, uh, and, and tension in the country, even to the extent that people are worried that China's going to fall apart, that China's getting too big to manage by the, the Communist Party. Yes, absolutely. I, I think this, well, you raise a very interesting question. It just, just recently, uh, this uh, very famous uh, sinologist, David, Professor David Shambo, wrote a, a big opinion piece about uh, the China's um, upcoming, is China cracking up? Is it cracking best, up? Yeah. Yes, especially predicting uh, Chinese communists are going to collapse. Um, but I, personally, I don't think it's going to happen. I think the Chinese Communist Party has proven to be more adaptable, and um, more resilient than many people predicted. For example, there are, he talked about discontentment, and I think that there are lots of discontentment. There are actually quite a lot of protests happening every day. But this kind of protests, they are mostly economic driven. And, for example, workers demanding high, high pay, um, workers, uh, farmers, their land being taken away, they haven't been compensated properly, they start to protest. Um, so they are economic driven, not politically driven, and they are also local. And many of the things that you talk about are actually cultural changes, mm -hmm. uh, the rise of freedom of expression mm -hmm. and religion, uh, a re birth of Confucius values as well mm -hmm. in China. Mm -hmm. Yes, I actually recently written a piece about the revival of a Confucius value, which is quite interesting. Um, many people thought there was this, this trend was manipulated by the government, mm -hmm. which I actually don't see. In the past 15 years, with China's fast economic growth and rising position in the world, people started asking mm -hmm. themselves the big question, who are the Chinese? Mm -hmm. What is our cultural value? I think communism kind of collapsed. Very few people really believe in communism. Yeah. But there's no replacement. And yet, throughout the imperial dynasty, Confucianism has been the dominant ideology. Now it's kind of returned as kind of an important part of uh, culture mm. and national identity. Mm. And I think in some ways the government is making use of that situation. For example, Confucius talking about respecting hierarchy, yes. respecting authority, yes. so they are making use of that yes. in some, some ways. But when, when people look at China today and just how fast it's growing yes. and the kind of slightly more assertive China in the world, do you think yes. China is a country that we should be fearing? I can understand why there's such a fear about China and uh, I think China does give lots of reason uh, for people to get worried. There's low democracy, there's lack of transparency, and China has poor human rights and China has indeed become more assertive on the international stage the, in the dealing with, for example, the territory disputes in South China Sea. Um, but I think some of the fear is generated by ignorance and what I'm trying to do is try to help people to understand where China is coming from uh, what's happening now, where's China going? I think once you have better understanding of China, then there will be less fear. Mm. Definitely there will be more empathy. Now, interesting, you just said a little while ago that there's a rise of prostitution in China, and even yes. you, you, you say your, your grandmother yes. was a concubine. Yes, yes. Um, and now, this is the theme of your brand new enterprise, Labour of Love. I yes, it's Labour of Love indeed. The yes, novel. yes. I just uh, completed my first novel called Lotus. It's a book about prostitution. I'm, I've been fascinated by the subject of prostitution ever since I learned that my own grandmother was actually uh, a working girl. I, I only learned that shortly before she passed away. Anyways, and my mother told me her story. She became an orphan and then sold into prostitution, and she met my grandfather on the job. <laughs> yes, and then 1949, when the communists uh, took over power, men were only allowed one wife, and my grandfather decided to stay with my grandma, his concubine. Coming from a journalistic background, you know, prostitution is actually just for me, it's a window to see the tensions brought by the reform. Um, as you probably know, that um, the vast majority of the working girls in China, they are migrant workers originally from rural China. Um, and they, they are poorly educated, um, unskillful, and ill-prepared Ill for the city life. And because of the risk system, uh, the job options are very limited. 
So anyway, so I'm just fascinated by the prostitution and wondered how the working girls cope with their daily life. So anyway, that's how it inspired my music. And it's based on the real life story of what's happening in Shenzhen. <laughs> it's a pure work of fiction. I did lots of research. It's not another memoir. No, I'm I didn't think it was for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, also I did a lot of research and I met a friend with prostitute and I, I worked even for NGO dedicated in helping female sex workers. So lots of uh, little details are, re- are real, but the story itself, the, the plot is all fabrication, not based on my own life. <laughs> Sorry. Well, fascinating. Look, I would love to speak to you for hours like this, but I think yeah. I'll conclude by just saying how wonderful it is to meet you here in Singapore. Oh, pleasure. Yeah. I realise that there's quite a lot that you have to offer in terms of helping to put the human face on China and its development when people need to understand that better. Yes. And you have a very fascinating, inspiring story of your own to tell. Well, Ligia, thank you very much for spending the time. My pleasure. Okay, we'll see you again very soon. Okay.